they would do would probably frustrate him and, and probably even wonder, where did, where did you get that? I'm trying to be a good little boy and stand still. I would like for us to consider this evening, still this one, right? Okay. Uh, this, this morning, a story. Sometimes it's easier to preach like on a theme or an idea, and that idea or theme spread out throughout the whole Bible. It takes a little more digging to find the goody in a little story or a setting and just stay with that passage. Good morning. Yeah, okay. You don't see his faces for a while, and it's good to see him back at home. I'd like to start with the first, with the, the last two verses of this story first, and then we're going to back up, read the story, ending with the last two verses again. Because the last two verses is what I'd like for, and I pray that really comes home to us today. Especially when you think in the, the context of whether or not I should mentor a child. And by the way, Javi, where'd you get off to? There you are. Yeah, big hand up. Okay. I want to thank you for choosing to mentor other young people to come and serve. That was the choice you made by reading scripture today. Thank you. So here we have an opportunity for not just adults to mentor young people. You're actually choosing to mentor like adults or young people mentoring young people. This is what was the context of last Sabbath when talking about press together, press together, encourage each other. We're responsible for each other. So let's bow our heads. Father, as we read this passage this morning, we're just asking that you be our teacher, our guide, convict our hearts of what you're calling us to truly be in these last days. Your chosen ones to press together, encourage each other, train each other. And we're acknowledging today that it is not about us, it's actually you and us doing all of it. What peace that truly is. Be with us now as we open your word is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. The last two verses of the story will be John chapter 18. John 18 verses 10 and 11. John 18 verses 10 and 11. I'll give you a moment because I want you to have your Bibles open, follow along. We're going to do some digging here. And... We got plenty of time, not in any rush. And you will gain a greater blessing by considering these, okay? John 18, verses 10 and 11. Are you there? Okay. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Is that close enough? Okay, is Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, should I not drink it? Unusual two verses to consider today, but let's prepare us by setting, setting it in motion by the previous verses. I'd like to start all the way back in chapter 17 because John chapter 17, you probably are already noticing how many of you got red lettered editions and you think, oh my goodness, there's a whole bunch of red letters here in chapter 17. Some of you might even have a subtitle here like my Bible does, Jesus Intercessory Prayer. Most of us would consider this prayer as the, garden that the, the prayer that Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, okay? So it's a wonderful prayer, just beautiful. But I thought I'd read just the last two verses to kind of set the tone of what Jesus was praying about. So I'm going to pick up his verse here, uh, his prayer in verses 25 and 26. John 17, 25. 
O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Even though the disciples had issues, they were still learning. They weren't really in tune with what was about to happen, but Jesus was still claiming them as his. They understand, they know, they've been told. And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it. He's not only has declared it in the past, but he's about to declare it even more. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be where? In them and I in them. What a powerful prayer he's praying to the Father on behalf of not just the disciples, but us also. And this is what happens next. And when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples. I'll have to admit, I was really fascinated this week in the morning prayer line when this book, the we asked simple questions, just wanting to dig into verses, and there was an unusual question asked. And it was, I wonder, I don't, God could only be the only one to do this sort of thing. But somebody asked a question, I wonder what the word brook means. B-R-O-O-K, Brook Kidron. And somebody says, well, I have a concordance here. Let's look it up. So they looked up the word, the word brook for the connect to the Kidron brook, and it was a frozen torrent, a frozen torrent. So that means it was the icy waters in the springtime when the snows were thawing and it was overflowing its banks. Is that being more descriptive? It wasn't, I have to admit, I've read this all my life thinking, oh, this is a little creek that maybe two or three rocks I get to stand on and I'm across. No. This is a big creek raging. This is why I want us to picture this because this is a direct connection to us today. Most of us can connect to trials and situations that are just hard and we don't understand why. But Jesus is able to cross that brook with us. He's actually already crossed it for us, okay? Even though it's deep and cold and fast and wide and as ugly as you want to paint it, he's been there, done that already. And Judas also, this is 18 verse 2, and I'm going to stop there just for a second to let you know the one that is the bad guy. Hey, there's no sense in beating around the bush. The bad guy's there too when it comes with dealing with that bad creek. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Again, this week, there's something that my, when I'm reading along, my mind jumps to different places in the Bible. Do you ever do that? My mind jumped here from this verse about the Pharisees and the chief priest coming thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. And my mind jumped to the story of Gideon. Becky's studying Gideon this week. And the story about Gideon is these 300 men that end up having their torches and their trumpets. And it only takes a few to bring truth to the picture. And in this group, they, <clears throat> they are, this group is falsely using the same instruments that should be bringing light into darkness, peace into storms. But no, they're causing confusion, they're causing doubt, they're causing fear. 
They're causing misunderstandings. But that's what the devil's all about, right? That's what he's about. But Jesus is not afraid. Jesus, therefore, in verse 4 says, knowing all things that should come upon him. Isn't that amazing? He already knows what's going to happen. His Father has showed him and revealed to him in Scripture or in prayer time exactly what's going to happen. And this is what he says. Whom seek ye? I have to ask you the same question this morning. Who are you seeking? Whom do you seek, not just today, but whom do you seek every day? Now, Jesus knows there's an issue with the mind of everyone there. We could take a moment and consider just who are all the different groups that are there. You know, we have the disciples. We have these Pharisees, chief priests or officers from them, in other words. Or, you know, some people might even say that there are Roman guards helping these officers that are working for the chief priests and Pharisees. There's Judas. And when we consider the setting and we think of it as in last day events applying to us today, my goodness, could that ever... I mean, Judas could be the evil one himself, the even the evil host. The ones being used by the evil host. The ones that are following Jesus don't have it really quite together yet. They want to do right, desiring to do what, right. They're following Jesus and they're wondering what's going on. And to hear the question, whom do you seek, could really apply to every living soul there. And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus said unto them, I am. I thought I'd stop because the little word he is a supplied word. For those men to hear the words, I am, He's claiming to be God. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon as he had said unto them, I am, they went backwards and fell to the ground. Amen. What power! My mind goes to the fact that they fell to the ground. It may sound something kind of simple, but to me it means it's getting back to basics. Who do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. They were not seeking the Christ. They were seeking a young boy that has grown up that was born in Bethlehem. They were seeking a man. They were not seeking God. And he says the I am to get back to basics. You're not seeking the right person. You're seeking for a human, and I'm offering you all of divinity. Let's get back to basics, shall we? I think this group did. They were not ready for what happened. And they ended up on the ground. But once you're in that position, when you realize, I need to be clear on the basics, Jesus knows that. He knows it in our hearts, in our minds. And then when he's got you where you need to be, now where do you need to be? I want to make sure you're with me on this. Where do you need to be? Focused on the Basics, foundational stuff. We're talking on the ground. Now, I'm not saying, well, so-and-so got so sick, they're finally on their back, now they're able to look up. No, that's not what I'm saying. You've heard that said about people. I'm saying sometimes we need to get back to the basic message 
so that truth can be heard. So we're on the ground. And Jesus has got you right where you need to be. Because now he asks the question, There we go. Okay. So he asked the question in verse 7. Then ask he them again, whom seek ye? It's not too often he does it this way. He backs up and says the same question again. This time, hoping that the perspective is different. Now, whom seek ye? Now, even though they answered Jesus of Nazareth, he replies differently. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am. You notice I keep dropping the he because it's supplied, right? I have told you that I am. If therefore ye seek me, let us go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them whom thou gavest me, have I lost none? I would like to emphasize a, a little bitty, itty bitty, itty bitty word in that verse to make it big, big, big. Okay? In verse 9 there. Because the, the red letter part, at the last part of verse 9, of them which thou gavest me have... I have lost none. The only way we can be lost is by our own choices. Because the question can be asked when reading, well, what about Judas? Judas was given to Jesus? Actually, Judas offered his services. But that doesn't matter. He still loved Judas. He was the first person that Judas the, the, he washed the feet of Jesus, Judas first and he loved Judas of them which thou gavest me have I lost none but then there's good old Simon Peter doesn't he just amaze you the things he does and says then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Another fascinating thing that came up this week when considering the name of Malchus. Does anybody know what his name means? King or Kingdom. This is such good news for me. Even though I'm working for, say, one of the, what, what does it say? The servant's name. So he could have been one of the servants of the Pharisees, servants of the high priest, servants of Judas. I don't know. Anyway, he's not one of the disciples, right? And he's, his name means king or kingdom, I don't know about you, but that gives me great hope that even though I might not know it yet and I might be sitting in an in a unhealthy condition, like an unfaithful situation in my life, I'm discouraged, I have doubt, or whatever ugly you want to add to it, it doesn't matter to Jesus. You're still a part of his kingdom. Because this setting is in Israel. All of these different people that are representing different people in the kingdom of Israel, they're still all his children. Amen? We are still all his children, no matter if we're visiting from Kentucky today or what. Now, I just made that up. I said, there's a lot of visitors here, so if one of you happened to be from Kentucky, God did that, okay? But the thing is, it doesn't matter where we're from or how we've been growing to get to the point where we are sitting in the pew today. Amen? Amen. So Peter does something 
and his actions is, is, a, is a big boo-boo, of course, right? He probably, of course, meant well, but he took a sword. Now, when we think of that word in the Bible, we think of sword of the Spirit, the Word, sword of truth. So symbolically, Peter has taken this and damaged somebody's hearing abilities. Don't kid yourself, what I just said happens a bunch. And the result from taking this and damaging another person's hearing abilities can definitely hinder the ability to hear the good news. Like in Sabbath school today, it was a privilege to not focus on the word war and focus on the word victory. We know we're in a battle. We think of Armageddon and all that sort of stuff all the time, but why don't we fix our minds on victory in Jesus? I can sleep a lot better thinking on that, can't you? Okay, so this is what Jesus is now trying to teach Peter because of the action that he just did with his sword. Okay, so listen to his words. Then Jesus said unto Peter, are you all with me now? John 18, 11? Is, are these verses becoming more powerful, right? Okay. Put up thy sword into the sheath. Now I'm just going to pause for a second. And you're thinking, the pastor's telling me to put away my Bible. I might ought to tell you to put it away if you've been using it like Peter. Okay. In other words, there's a time and place for everything. These promises that you just pluck out of the blue, apparently there's a powerful time and place to use each particular promise even. Like, wow, did I ever need that promise today? Sometimes Becky has her worship. You got to hear this one. And, I, and it just makes my day too. So here, listen to what happens next. The cup of which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? He know in his prayer, Father, if it be thy will to take this cup from me, he's talking about the whole crucifixion process. If there be another way, you know, not my will, but thy will be done. The cup which my Father hath given me, in other words, Jesus says, I'm accepting that cup now. I have received it from the Father. My faith is that I am to go through this. Shall I not drink it? Are you telling me that what is supposed to happen doesn't need to happen? Or I don't have to do it? Or, oh, let's, let's just get down to the nitty-gritty. Are you telling me that all those lambs that were slain for 4,000 years, I don't have to worry about them ending? We're just going to let them continue. Shall I not drink it? Can we not declare that victory over the devil is possible? Let's declare it. Let's allow this event to take place. Let's allow the cup to be drank. This gets real heavy to me. Because I want to be a good mentor, don't you? You like that idea, don't you? I, I mean, I have to admit that, well, you already know this. You know, Becky and I don't have children. But we love working with children, and we love y'all. And the idea of, quote, being a hands-on mentor, you know, I, I get my fix quite often at school, and even today, to have a young person come up to me, give me a big hug, 
and look me up in the look at me eye to eye and say, I want to thank you for praying for my mama. Hey, don't kid you, that'll make you day. There's a key point here that my prayer from the bottom of my heart is that you hear from this, these last two verses. Peter has misused truth. And Jesus, as Peter's mentor, reveals to him the best way to reveal truth is to focus on the death and life of Jesus Christ first. I need that to be heard. Because what I just shared with you will be your foundation for being a good mentor, a good parent, a good leader, the foundation to get across any point you ever want to put on paper or any point you want to think up, whether, well, I'll get to that. Any point you want to think up that you want to get across to a young person, you can do this through the power of Jesus Christ. That message about whatever you want to talk about must be preceded by the story of victory in Jesus at the cross. I think there was about two more amens that time. This is not a, a play thing. This is serious. I'm about to do something because I don't want to be accused of something. Like, <laughs> Marguerite, you're sitting up here by yourself. Becky was with you. You're up here. And, and if I turn my head over that way, you naturally know I'm looking at you, right? Yeah, okay. And so on and so forth. If I turn my head in a certain direction, yeah, yeah I'm looking at you. Okay. Oh, whoa. The reason I'm coming down here is because I deliberately want to look this way. So I don't get accused of, you were talking to me, weren't you? I'm talking to me today. I am talking to me because I want to be the best mentor possible, mentor possible. So Father, in every single subject that you call me to train up a young person to understand. I am asking that you give me the best way to present the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus first before I present to them how to be a good husband. how to be a good wife, how to be a good father or mother, that they clearly understand that victory in every single area is possible through Him. How to be a good, a good Sabbath school teacher, how to be a gentleman helping somebody at Walmart. How to be faithful. How to be honest. How to be an encourager. How to, 
how to consider the subject of tithing. How to be evangelistic. How to be willing to serve. How to be used by you no matter any subject brought up. No matter what point made. If it's not in the context of the gospel, it is useless you may as well be cutting off ears. I made a statement about one of those things I mentioned. I can only imagine how difficult it's going to get in the last days. How our faith will be tested again and again in areas that it's never been tested before. How are we going to present faithfulness to the children if we don't put it in the context of the faithful one? It's impossible. I know I look at things a little different. But if, if I'm considering the subject of tithe, you know, it's, it's more than just a tenth. To me, it's everything. The other nine parts They're not mine either. Everything is his. I just have the privilege of yielding a tenth and watch him grow the ninth into 20%. Way beyond. He is the faithful one. It's almost like the subject of Sabbath. How, do you, how are we going to mentor young people on how to keep Sabbath? I'll tell you what, if you think of, well, I'm not going to challenge because uh, the kindergarten. I don't know who's teaching kindergarten. Or, anyway, there, there used to be a song, One Day for Jesus, Six for, six for Me and One Day for Jesus or something like that. I mean, that's not a healthy way to look at it, that we're resting in Him. It don't stop today. Once we realize the importance of what we're giving to Him, we realize it's everything. The faith that we're acknowledging, the faith in Him that we're revealing, actually floods our whole life. How are you using your sword? How do you intend to be a mentor? Man, I can't wait. I'm looking forward for... Uh, there's uh, four young people I want to choose to mentor. And I can't wait to go to chill yogurt with them twice a week. We're going to talk about the Garden of Eden and all those goodies that will go on top of my yogurt. And, and if I was to show, see a show of hands of which four want to be 
Yeah, I can see 30 go up, okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you guys are over the hill. Okay, sorry. It's got to be in the setting of good news. I pray you hear that today. Jesus was mentoring Peter. Peter, put the sword away. There's a time and place for everything, and this ain't it. Let the good news come forth. Let the cup be drank. Let the cup be understood first. Priorities will come in the place as the good news is the foundation is laid. Whom are you seeking today? Whom are you seeking to reveal today? Whom are ye called to reveal to others? today. Please stand with us. Let's open our hymnals to number 249. Praise him, praise him. Please stand.
Lord, thank you for the picture you gave me while we were singing then of Jesus in heaven calling us over with his hand, saying, come over here, let me tell you a story. And as he waves his hand, we see that scar in the hand. Thank you for calling us so tenderly and lovingly with the good news, the blessed hope, eternal love. This is why we will follow you forever. Make it so in all of our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen.